Hey, I'm Safa. I'm Mr. Pressure. We are the Hilltop Hoods, and we're hanging out with Rob on Front Row Live. What's the deal? I feel like you guys haven't been in the States. Um, and it's been a while, a while since the last time you guys have come. So, you know, what's this trip, this U.S. world tour that you guys are doing right now? Um, we put out a record, Great Expanse, in February. And how long has it been since we've been in the States? Like three years, four uh, years? We were here last 2014, I think. Yeah. With Sims. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah. That's a long time. Was that that double album? Yeah, that's right. We are we, we are remixed with the Symphony Orchestra, our yeah. sort of last two records, um, Walking Under Stars and Drinking From The Sun. That's a long time. <laughs> well, welcome back to the States. Yeah, I'm thanks. glad you guys are here. Um, you know, talk to me about this, this eighth album that you guys just dropped, The Great Expanse, and, you know, like... Eight albums, that's, you know, creative process, I'm sure, changes after every album. But after eight albums, I'm sure, like, there's also exhaustion at the same time. Like, talk to me about the creative process of this record and, like, what made it different from your previous material? Well, for a start, it probably took uh, our longest to put the, this record out. Um, we kind of stepped away for a bit and yeah. me and Saf had kids. Uh, kids. Not, not together. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some little ones and sort of probably took about three years to make the record in yeah. total. So it was, it was a long time between our albums. Um, but yeah, as far as sort of evolution goes, it's probably our most collaborative record yet. Mm -hmm. um, worked with a lot of artists, a lot of producers, yeah. uh, singers, songwriters. Um, yeah, lots of different people. Now, I noticed like in the previous records, like you guys have always had many producers like involved in, in your projects. Um, has there been a specific producer that kind of sticks out to you guys that kind of challenged you guys the most? Um, and if so, like, how did that challenge kind of lead you guys to this record? Um, one of our favorite producers is actually drums for us live as well, Plutonic Lab. Okay. And on this record, um, we started working with him more with the beats, with the production. Yeah. And um, he's, he's like a really technical guy but he's also a very musical guy so he's a great combo to work with nice. and I like I used to produce a lot for us but I, I I was off tools for so long that I lost that muscle memory a bit yeah. I, I didn't have that confidence in the studio so I've sort of been flipping samples at home and finding samples and then I'll flip them to him and I'll say to him take this and just make a better version of what I did. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he co-produced a lot of the record rather than sort of being the direct the producer. Run, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't, I would, yeah, co-produce is generous, I think. <laughs> like, uh, no, like we, we, went, we went back and forth a lot, but like, um, you know, I don't want to take anything away from what he does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he, he mixed the record as well. He ended up mixing the record. So like, you know, he's able to challenge us with what he knows mm. and like how things should sound. And we sort of sometimes have to take that and work backwards from there in a way. But yeah, we work with a lot of producers. Like Trials, the guy that we work with, he's prolific and he's challenging to work with because his output's just so much. Mm. And so you like fall in love with a beat and he's sent you another five or 10 <laughs> or something like that. I can't match his output, man. <laughs> man. Every time he gets on a plane, he takes his, um, he takes his pads with him and smashes a beat out. Oh, man. Like he's crazy, like yeah. multiple beats a day. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. I'm trying to watch a season of Deadwood on the plane. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to make beats, so. especially with my elbows. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, that's your only time you really get to relax. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to work either. Nah, I got two kids at home, so like, when I get on a plane, that's me time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just hitting that bar the whole way here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how different is it, like, the creative process now that, you know, there's families involved, there's, there's children in your lives? Like, I'm sure that adds more to the emotions. I'm sure that adds more to, like, creative ideas that you guys have. But, like, how do you guys feel that it kind of changed you this time? It's definitely challenging working around a family just time-wise. They take up a lot of your time. And when you're an artist and you're working from home, it's kind of like... It's a challenge to separate the two, yeah. um, work time and family time. Apart from that, I don't think it changed the creative process at all, though. I, I, I find it just, yeah, like I say, I'm more yeah. time poor. Same for you? Yeah, it's uh, the same issues as him. It's just being time poor. Mm -hmm. And, like, I um, used to have a – my studio used to be across from our bedroom, 
And when my first daughter came along, that became her nursery. Yeah. So I built a new studio. And on reflection, um, I, if I had to do it again, I would have built it somewhere else. Yeah. I, I, I built it underneath our house. <laughs> and as a result, like my phone, I can be in the studio for all of like 20 minutes and I'll get a message like, can you come up and grab? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, ah. But yeah, like, you know, it does begin to inform the way you think mm -hmm. a little because like there's certain things i probably would have said on a record 10 years ago not just like because because uh, of our evolution not just because of that because like in the back of your head there's something saying like you know your daughters are going to hear this one right. day so <laughs> that, that that's working on some level you know what i mean like yeah Try, trying for it to make you a better person. This, this is what you're getting at. Yeah. So since you said that, is that the reason why the first four albums are not available on Spotify or any like streaming service? Well, um, they're just old. And, um, we started making music when we were really young. Like We started making music in high school, and it's kind of one of those things we don't want to live and die by our earliest music. <laughs> it's it's really dated, and, and we're kind of, yeah. I guess, aware of that. Yeah, it doesn't, like, from state of the art, which we put out in 2009, it's the 10th anniversary this year. Mm. Onwards, I feel like we sort of take pri a lot of pride in that catalog um, mm. and that's what's available online. And before then, eh, <laughs> well, not, 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 like, not like ashamed or anything yeah. like that. We just doesn't f don't feel like it represents us. Mm. And like if someone's coming to our music for the first time, we don't want that to be the first port of call sort of right. thing. No, you know, we've been making music together 20 years, so yeah. you change as a person a lot in 20 years, so we don't, you know, we probably say some things in that record that are like, uh, yeah. <laughs> in some of those records. Yeah, yeah. we were like 20 year olds, and 20 year olds say knucklehead shit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, like, <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. so within those 20 years that you guys have of, of a career, like, how do you feel your artist development has kind of like evolved, especially like in the last few years that you guys have been touring nonstop? Yeah, I think everything changes. The, the creative process, the way we go about um, writing rhymes and writing songs has definitely changed. I feel like we're more songwriters these days as much as we are sort of just rappers. I guess back in the day we had a tendency just to find some a hot beat and sort of throw some verses on it, but it's it's uh, it's more comes from a place now that like we're writing hooks probably and you know chord structures yeah. before we are verses and that sort of thing. Yeah, we're trying to... Nowadays, we're trying to craft songs yeah. rather than just make a track, which sort of like, which is fine yeah. and which is, you know, like fun, but like we want a bit more substance to it now, I guess. Is that the reason why like you guys have so many more features this time around? Because it's like different, different genres of, of artists that you guys have on your records now, especially right now, one of the hottest, he was just in town for two sold out shows and he's been selling out his tour. Uh, rule who you guys yeah, have man. on yeah. your record so it's like what kind of inspired you guys to to bring him on board and like what was that chemistry like between all of you guys um he was being managed by a friend of ours who's an old school hip-hop dj so we sort of got connected through him and um yeah we just wanted to work with the the young dude has got crazy talent Same. and crazy voice and he's gonna be he's already massive actually i was gonna say he's gonna be massive but he's kind of he's already blowing up but i don't think there's kind of there's no ceiling for him yeah um and yeah so we sort of we knew about him from a fair few years ago i guess because of our friend and uh, we sat down with his co-writer one day and uh and wrote that song fire and grace which was an awesome experience as well we haven't sort of in the past actually sat in the same room and sort of been collaborative with pe people outside our yeah. immediate circle for things like choruses and hooks and that sort of thing. So it was, a, it was an awesome experience and something different for us to go about it that way, just to sit down, create it and record it and knock it out then and there. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier you guys focused more on choruses and the songwriting as opposed to like the beats. Um, did that kind of change the way that you guys wrapped your delivery now because of the way that you guys are writing the, the material? Um, I guess what informs that is like we we tour so much mm. um, probably more the thing that informs that more is the touring because you're thinking about when you're writing a song doing it live yeah and you've got that element in the back of your head as well sort of thing like right. um, 
It definitely informs sort of the direction of the song, subject matter, and, and the musicality of it. And I guess once that's sort of all locked in, the the the, the verses and the rest of the writing kind of just, just gets built around that. But yeah. Yeah, we've got a saying like, well, maybe I've got a saying. Give me my. The albums have a tendency to write themselves. Okay. So, like, you can go in, like, best laid plans and all, all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, like, you know, you, you've got this track that it was always going to sort of go that way yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like every every song on The Great Expanse sort of, we took a slightly different approach to it as well. Like I was saying, we sat down and wrote some hooks with a few artists this time. It was pretty different. And then other songs were kind of came about in a different way and then there came a point where there was probably 20 songs and we <laughs> cut half of them and yeah. and yeah and the album sort of takes its own shape over time yeah was there a specific track on this record that challenged you guys the most like maybe didn't even make it to the to the album uh, there's a track called leave me lonely on there that's like 132 bpm i think that's one of my favorites actually from oh, the record thank you, man. and um that was it was fun to write to yeah but to um get my delivery right it took me 1400 takes odd <laughs> and so yeah that was a challenge recording that track you, you just lay that shit down and speed it back up <laughs> once you record it, man. look at that, that time stretch tool on that. <laughs> well, why did you believe in that song so much that like no matter how much it challenged you like you still wanted it to be part of the record i'm stubborn like <laughs> as well like if if like I, if i get up against a challenge like that i'm like no nah, yeah. i've just got to knock it out but like i knew that was probably going to be um one of the biggest singles from the record which it was mm -hmm. and i really wanted really wanted to play that song live as well because it's you know it's 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 such a sort of party track and it was one of those songs as well. So he, he had the lead creative on that song and he mm. played it to me and I was like, oh shit, this is like, this is the joint. We yeah. have to we have to do this. Like from start to finish, it's like you're ready to like have a good time. Yeah, yeah. It's just a really infectious groove and it's kind of, it's one of those grooves that's familiar as well to people, mm. um, even though they haven't heard our version of it. Yeah. Now, you know, talk to me about the tracks that you guys used, uh, the instrumentations and stuff. Like what inspired these sounds? Um, and why did you guys feel like they were perfect for this album? Well, it's funny, like, we actually named this album The Great Expanse because it was kind of an eclectic bunch of tracks. Yeah. So it wasn't, like, a lot of cohesion with parts of the record. Like, yeah. a track, say, H is 4 up against Leave Me Lonely uh, in two completely different worlds. Yeah. So, like, as we were rolling along, making the record, we were kind of starting to realise that, that there was a lot of stuff that didn't, necessarily have the cohesion that we've had in past albums mm. so yeah a lot of that came down to you know we decided on these sounds and these things that we liked individually it was a matter of how we were going to bring them together yeah. and like just track order and things like that just little little things that yeah. you can fine tune afterwards and mixing and stuff like that to bring it together I don't think I answered your question. I think, <laughs> I, th I think I answered a question that you I answered a great question on. though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like you know, we've g him and me have got a similar ear, and you know when producers bring us stuff like we both like, there's nothing on a record that me and him haven't both agreed on. Mm. Like there's never something that it was just like I wanted on there or he wanted on there. Um, We've got this similar sort of taste in in beats. Yeah. yeah. Grew up on the same 90s rap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's true. Now, that being said, do you think that's that's the key to the longevity that Hilltop Hoods has had? Yeah, I guess um, I think sort of the friendship we have is one of the big keys and, and the similar music taste. We've learned to work with each other over the years. Like when we were younger, we used to fight over songs, <laughs> you know, like... Not, not not personal, but just fight yeah. over the creative direction of things, right. and we've kind of learned to how to give way and <laughs> and concede and and compromise, and and it, and it's you know it's important when you're working right. with with when there's two people that are sort of both wanting to lead a creative sort of on a song, yeah, you got to. Yeah, and that benefits the music in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I've always been quietly competitive with each other, so <laughs> <laughs> and actually I don't think it's that quiet. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's cool because I feel like within each album, you guys have changed it up a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more, but you don't lose the the taste of of the group. Like 
do, uh, is there like a certain, I don't know, like, is there like a certain remedy or like a certain solution to making the sound that Hilltop's hoods, uh, Hilltop Hoods does? Well, we, we follow something I call the Beastie Boys model. Mm. So like, you know, we, we've been doing this a long time and we've seen lots of eras of genres, yeah. like subgenres within the genre go past and, you know, more pop up. And we're not trying to make like SoundCloud rap or yeah. trap music or something. We just don't get it, don't understand it. Wouldn't be genuine. Like with us, like we just, what takes area takes area. Like we're at the mercy of that. Mm. Like, um, and what Beastie Boys did was like, they just made songs that sounded like Beastie Boys, but yeah. e each record, um, they progress and uh, they sounded better and it's the dynamics were better and stuff like that. So they were kind of like their own genre. So like, you know, it's a Beastie Boys record. When you heard a Beastie Boys record, it was a Beastie Boys record, yeah, but, exactly. and it just Im improved and improved and improved. Yeah. So that's what we try to do. I'm not saying- Well, it we sounds like you guys, I mean, when I listen to the stuff, it's obvious it's you guys. Like it doesn't, like I don't question it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the, the sound has evolved over the years, but it, like you said, it's still very much us. It evolves every record a little bit, and we yeah. try new things. We want to, you know, use new sounds, work with new people, yeah. um, which naturally sort of taints the sound as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not we're not trying to just suddenly step outside of our, I just I guess the zone of the sort of of what we like making. We're just we're trying to just make music that we want to make and yeah. what we'd want to listen to right. ourselves. Now, you know, as far as like tours, like this is, I think this, this tour right now was deemed the biggest tour, um, off any like New Zealand hip hop group, Australian. um, or Australian, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Australian hip hop groups. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> I feel like I'm the one that just had that flight. <laughs> New Zealand, New Zealand are on the other side of this, of the screen. From just this Denver just, group right here. He's seeing himself laughing right now. <laughs> But I feel like this this tour was deemed like the biggest the biggest tour for many like hip hop artists. Um, so, what do you guys think was the challenge in order that you guys had faced in order to get to where you're at today? Oh man, maybe we just got a little bit ahead of ourselves <laughs> and too excited when we planned this tour. Uh, it's, I think it's 53 or 54 shows across the yeah. world, and uh, and we're here in the U.S. and Canada doing it doing it last uh, yeah. last 20 here. But I think, I think the challenges we faced overseas, like a big thing was the accent. Mm -hmm. And like, no matter, like, it's funny, like when you come through customs, like um, they always ask like, what do you do? And you're like, I'm in a, in a band. And they're like, what kind of music? And like a hip hop group. And the way they talk to you, the way they interact with you and sort of laugh is like, what are you do doing bringing ice to Antarctica sort of thing, you know what I mean? And like Australian hip hop. So <laughs> I, 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 I think once p people get past the accent and everything like that, we're good. Or once like we're pretty confident in our live show as well, once we get them in front of us, we're yeah. good. But like I find particularly in North America, um, the accent was a bit of a barrier. It's not yeah. so much a barrier in Europe because like English is everyone's second language, yeah. so that accent doesn't come into play as much. Right. But well, and, and, you know, and if you're in somewhere like the UK, there's a lot of artists in the UK that are making hip hop with a UK accent, yeah. a, a regional or whatever sort of part of the world they're from. But here, you know, being that it, it all started here, yeah. um, the accent could be a bit comical at first. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, we find our own accent comical as well, <laughs> like, you know. And like, I can be so Australian, I, I'm not even like, conscious of it yeah. like even downstairs in the lobby i was like g'day how are you man like yeah. you know like right, right. <laughs> g'day g'day yeah, so we have the ability to take the piss out of ourselves as well, <laughs> which is very important when you're bringing rap music to america right. <laughs> so you guys uh before this tour you guys went on tour supported eminem yeah um and prior to eminem you guys were one of the few people to share a stage with outcast like another like is that not true? No, no, no. Did you guys not do a I, festival I like alongside? Stage of that cast. <laughs> um, no. I don't think so. You guys never did a festival with Outkast? I could have sworn you guys did. I'm, I'm actually now. I'm like, oh shit, did we? Yeah. No, nah, I, I, I would. I would. I would remember that. I remember that too. Dang. Oh, you're talking about Fraunfeld. Yeah, they were on Fraunfeld in um, Switzerland one year. 
Yeah, uh, on, on a different day to us, I think. Oh, okay, okay. No, so you're That's right. why you didn't consider it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a it's just like a it's a camp out festival. It goes for three days. Yeah. All hip hop. There's about fifty thousand Swiss kids in the mountains. There, beautiful yeah. festival. That's awesome. Yeah, they did play it one year that we played it. We were on a different day. Yeah. So we did. Sure, we played with that. I mean, technically, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, what about Eminem? Like, what, you know, what was that vibe like throughout the tour that you guys did with him? And, uh, you know, like, how different were those kind of runs? What was interesting, we did the Australian New Zealand run with him. It was interesting because, you know, back home, we're used to sort of doing headline tours mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It was a bit like, I, I guess the word's hum humbling, like yeah. when you're the support act. And he's like, you know, one of the biggest acts in the world. Right. He's got a huge stadium show, like with the pyro, the AV, you know, 20 person band, string section, Skylar Gray, Royce. It's an amazing show. Yeah. So like coming on before that, there's a lot of pressure mm. involved and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. But we, we had a really good time. It was the second time we've done the Rapture tour. We did a, the first time he came through, we did it when he was um, touring with Lil Wayne. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was an amazing experience. Like, you know, he was playing stadiums. So we were playing stadiums by, <laughs> by, uh, uh, by course of that. And like, you know, he played in, in Melbourne at the MCG Melbourne Cricket Ground. Mm. And he had like 84,000 people. And it was like, he, he sold, like, that's the biggest show anyone's ever done in the Southern Hemisphere, I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, like he beat Rolling Stones and stuff like that. Shit. So he was a part of it. So yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <making> history. Yeah. <laughs> he made history. We were just there to like, hey. <laughs> well, lucky enough to steal his crowd for uh, thirty minutes that <laughs> night, and it was pretty crazy playing to that many people as well. And you know, we we're pretty acutely aware of before we went on stage that they're not our fans; right. they're Eminem fans, and we're just you know, get. Down in front of them, but yeah, no, but that absolutely amazing. We yeah. we had a, a great time. We were, we were a bit worried about well, I was a bit worried about New Zealand because in the past, like you know, I, I don't know how to describe it here, but like sort of U.S. Canada rivalry, a rivalry sort of yeah. there. There's a bit of Australia, <laughs> yeah, like New Zealand rivalry, but, <laughs> but um, when you're in front of sixty thousand people that don't know your music, you don't know. Yeah. I don't know how healthy that rivalry is <laughs> going to be, but it was great. New Zealand went off. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Well, you guys are about to kick off the final leg here in the States, yeah. San Diego tomorrow. Then you guys have the Roxy in Hollywood on Saturday. So, you know, what can fans expect on this final leg? Like what, you know, those that are coming out, what's, what's going to happen once that, once you guys hit the stage? Well, being that it's the great expanse tour, we're playing a bunch of songs off the new record, but we got a long old set. It's like an hour and a half. Okay. So we, we, we play a lot of back catalog as well. Nice. We've got, um, a Plutonic Lab, our drummer, he's riding with us. And Adrian Eagle, who's a soul singer from nice. back he's home. On the album. And um, his, his um, yeah, and DJ Total Eclipse holding it down. And I don't know, man, it's just a party. We try to make, a, we, we try to make the party. Yeah. <laughs> As the people in Germany, which we just got back from, are you ready to make the party? <laughs> so, yeah. Like, um, you know, they can expect the party. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks for taking the time to having me. Jeez. Let me. Well, that, that was. That, what, how did. That was. That was, was gotta cut that handshake out, man. We got to do this again, man. This, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what just happened. <laughs> that, that was that, <laughs> let's just, just fist pump. There we go. There we go. Thanks, guys. You guys be sure to check out Hilltop Hoods. They're on tour right now. Get the new album, The Great Expanse. Thanks for watching on Front Row Live.